Hello and welcome to participant who just joined in. We are going to be live just in a few minutes. But I think we will wait for a little bit more for the participants to join in. We hope everyone have no problem in joining in, but if there's any problem, just let me know in the chat section. We have more than 500 registrants from all around the world. Let me just welcome everyone who just joined in. Good morning, Budapest, and good afternoon, those from India. Good morning and afternoon, those from Middle East, and good evening, USA. And of course, good afternoon, participants from Indonesia. Hello, Indonesia. Thank you for joining this webinar. Hope everyone is well and healthy. And we will start in about three, two, one. Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to Pain Institute of Indonesia. And my name is Fajri Rizki on behalf of the organizing committee. We would like to extend our thank you everyone who have joined in. In this digital dialogue of interventional pain update series three. We would also like to greet everyone who have followed us from episode one. And thank you for joining us once again. We are honored to have with us today our guest expert live all the way from the Budapest, Hungary, Dr. Agnes Sojikza. Today's webinar is brought to you by Penn Institute of Indonesia and our sponsor, Nobel Robivel, and sporting organizer by Ice Academy. We would like to convey important message and guideline Please note that your microphone is muted throughout the session and please post your question in the Q&A section anytime throughout the session and this session will be recorded. And to this agenda, after this, there is opening remarks by Penn Institute of Indonesia and after that, we will start the regenerative therapy presentation and video by Agnes Sojitza, MD, FIPP, SHIPS, Astra, PMUC. We also divided on two sections, question and answer, with panel discussion. And then closing remarks. Faculty of the day, Agnes Sojitza, MD, FIPP, SHIPS, Astra, PMUC. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our host and moderator of YOPCOT. Yossi Asmara, MD, FIPM, FIPP, CHIPS. Hey, my friends from Indonesia, or at least know some of you guys are there. I had a fantastic time in Indonesia. Kindest, loveliest people ever with the loveliest country. And welcome to everybody else who is not from Indonesia. Uh, I'm going to share my screen from now on. Is that correct, Yoshi? Yes. Please. I don't yes. think I can share unless you unshare. I need permission to share my slides. Okay. Still unavailable. Maybe now. Oh, there we go. Now it's okay. So Yoshi asked me to talk about regenerative medicine. And it's such a vast topic. And I kept thinking, should I 
they asked me to do a basic talk, but many of you guys already know the basics. So I picked pretty much the two ends. I, I will talk about the basics, the concepts, the evidence. And for those who are advanced, I will show you a cervical PRP uh, live procedure. So everybody gets something to take home. Yoshi read my CV or my resume. That's nothing to add to that. I have nothing to disclose, no financial interest in what I have to say. A big, big topic that we're going to talk about. Yoshi, I need one feedback. Is the quality good? Does it work okay? Yeah? Can't hear you, Yoshi. Does it work okay? I hear nobody. It's okay. We can see. Thank you. Thank you. Now I know the technic technical challenges are all tackled. So we'll talk about the basic uh, wound healing. We'll focus mostly on PRP and prolotherapy. I picked those two because I think it's more accessible in, uh, in Indonesia. It's less expensive and have very nice outcomes. And then we'll review a bit of evidence and the case demo. Before we get to it, I wanted to show you a few slides on what we've been doing so far and how it actually does not work. This is a, one of my favorites, a JAMA article. The effects of intraarticular triamcinolone versus saline on knee cartilage volume and pain patients with knee osteoarthritis. If you see the conclusion, it, after two years of, of following these patients, what they found that the patients who got triamcinolone steroid, they had a significant loss of cartilage volume. This is the last thing you want to give to your osteoarthritis patients, correct? This is another one also in a pretty relevant paper or journal, Lancet published the safety for corticosteroid injections for tendinopathy. And this is what they concluded, that although it's good short term, it is actually worse than any other treatment in the long term. You ruin your patient's tendons. This came out in the musculoskeletal radiology seminars. They came up with the strong scientific evidence that indicates that corticosteroid injections for tennis elbow worsen the long-term outcome. So even though we look good, we do the steroid, patient thinks we know what we do, but we harm them. So most or many of the physicians are shying away now from steroids. Uh, this paper, I thought I'd show you it, it's by a Hungarian group I published. It's a basic science study, what they did uh, they they bathed uh, chondrocyte cells in steroid and in local anesthetics. And what they found is that bupivacaine essentially killed all the chondrocytes. And ropivacaine is also very bad, but lido, beta metasone, and prednisolone also brings outcomes that you just don't want to have. So what do we have? Let's get to our topic. What is the alternative? I gotta say, we have a beautiful alternative. It is regenerative medicine. It is the process where we want to replace what we ruined. Well, like you want to redo what's been destroyed. And the body has quite a bit of regenerative uh, mechanism. It fades over time. Kids do better. They heal from everything, right? But as we get older, our repair mechanisms are not as good. That's why we have the osteoarthritis, but that is also why we have cancers. And this, there is an option to enhance the regenerative me me mechanisms. If you go to PubMed and you put platelet-rich plasma, this is what you find. 45,000 publications, essentially. So I thought, let's just check for review papers or, actually, or randomized control trials. So platelet-rich plasma, RCTs, it's still 5,700. And I thought we need to narrow it more down. Let's look at systematic reviews. Again, 9,000. And if you go a bit more specific, let's put 
uh, I did uh, Peter. I wanted to show another one, it doesn't pop up. If you put uh, platelet rich plasma for knee, you also get around 10,000 hits. That's the most studied, uh, along with the tennis elbow. So, what can we see? More and more publications are coming up. It is truly a hot topic. I would say this is the hottest topic of pain medicine, possibly along with spine cord stem, where it has a lot of industrial support. Nevertheless, uh, even though I'm absolutely impressed with the outcomes and the uh, possibilities with degenerative medicine, you need to understand it is still the Wild West. Okay? There's a lot of companies, a lot of physicians doing a lot of random things that's not necessarily good for the patients. So it's exciting, uh, but it's still considered, or many of it is considered experimental and investigational. And you need to watch what you say and do and what you promote. So what's the concept? This is the concept. I like things nice and simple. This is the concept. You want to improve the balance between repair and breakdown, re to make the repair more, right? It is all based on this uh, inflammatory cascade that you've seen and learned even and probably grade one in, in university. Very important. The way we heal is that we, get, we have this inflammatory cascade. At the beginning, here you have the inflammatory phase that's essentially uh, like the first 72 hours most important. That comes with the bleeding, the coagulation, platelet gets activated, and then the granulos granulocytes uh, feed in, uh, the phagocyt phagocytosis happens to, to clean up the wound. Then you get to the cell proliferation phase, and then it leads to the matrix remodeling. With the language, we can only describe it in a linear way, but truly, it's a lot of parallel processes that are happening that leads to reinforcement of the tissue that's got damaged. So what do we have? Chronotherapy is about actually a hundred year old now, started by George Stuart Hackett. Uh, dry needling is quite old as well. You don't inject anything. You put the needle to the problem area and probably because of the uh, tissue disruption, you activate the inflammatory cascade. Autologous whole blood used to be popular and put in the knee, and especially in, in many sky for a long time. That's falling out of favor now because of the, of the deleterious effects of red blood cells intraarticularly. What we have now, most popular, is probably PRP, platelet rich plasma. Prolotherapy is getting very popular finally, that warms my heart. Stem cells uh, could come from bone marrow or fat tissue. And of course, the future will bring all kinds of fascinating things like bioengineering, 3D printing, it's also an option. This is a slide that uh, I made to summarize how all of these regenerative techniques feed in. And I want to start here at the, at the green box. What we want is tissue healing. We get there by the inflammatory cascade. And you get to the inflammatory cascade by platelet activation, which is happening from cell injury and lipid leakage. Of course, the mesenchymal stem cells also participate in either way. What they do, they coordinate the healing. There is a very common misconception that the stem cells will actually turn into cartilage cells or will actually turn into ligaments. That's the least likely. One week after the injection is less than 1% of the old MSK uh, mesenchymal stem cells present. They coordinate. And then we get to the left side of the screen. Chronotherapy feeds into this process by causing cell injury and lipid leakage because it's hyperosmolar. PRP also feeds in because it's 
actually in the platelet itself and it gets activated. And then also, of course, because you inject, it leads to a cell injury. And then the stem cells, which can come from, let's say, bone marrow concentrate, they activate platelets. And of course, they put them there to coordinate the healing. I would say prolotherapy uh, is possibly my favorite. We calculated for some data collection. We've done over 10,000 cases uh, together with my uh, lovely colleague, Edith Ratz. Uh, and this is the treatment that we do mostly to our family and ourselves. Uh, so yeah, I can say this is my favorite. And the reason I put it for the front for you guys because it's very cheap. It's actually sugar water. As bad as it sounds, it's sugar water. Uh, I also say it's the poor doctor's PRP. It's a bit of a, a foster kid for us because the sugar water is, is very cheap and that's the political part. Sugar water does not get much uh, industrial support. This is the concept. Let's say the guy lifted the heavy furniture and he felt a pop and felt pain in his back. When you do prolotherapy, you inject everywhere where there is a, a ligamentous injury, which is decided based on a lot of the time, mainly on physical exam. And then you motivate the tissue, tissue, uh, body to lay down new tissues. So that's what it does. Prolotherapy, which is essentially a dextrose solution, it stimulates the inflammatory cascade. And the way it does, because it's hyperosmolar, it creates a cell shrinkage. And with the stress, with leakage of the lipids, uh, leads to the temporary inflammation, increased growth factors, and this response uh, leads to the inflammatory cascade activation. So here we go. We use dextrose. Uh, these are the alpha granules and the dense granules of the platelets because dextrose already activated the platelets by the membrane leakage. And then you get all these growth factors uh, that participate in the healing. Let's get to the platelet-rich plasma. We know, right? It's, it's getting pretty famous now, even patients know. You take the blood, you spin it down. Here you have the red blood cells. You have the buffy coat, which contains the platelets and the white blood cells. And then you also have the platelet-poor plasma. This is the section that we want to use. And the slide is the same as before. Of course, because you put the platelets there, you have, they have the alpha granules, the dense granules, and then the inflammatory cascade on its going. When do we use regenerative medicine? You can use it in acute and chronic injury, chronic tendinosis, ligament injury, cartilage injury. Acute is getting more and more popular, acute injury. A lot of it is a financial decision. Here in Hungary, I leave the patients, I very rarely do it for acute injury. I let the patients heal if the, if the healing goes well, I don't interfere. We have plenty of patients anyway. So here we go. What happens? Uh, this guy will have a tennis elbow, right? If he has a poor backhand, I think he does not have a poor, poor backhand, by the way. But if he does, then he will have a tennis elbow. You can add the repetitive motion injury of the shoulder, you can twist your ankle, you, you can be an acute or an over, overuse injury. And many uh, of the people simply develop a wear and tear. This guy will have back pain. And the woman who sits 12 hours in front of the sewing machine will develop the neck pain, the shoulder pain, not to mention these workers on the field or anybody who sits at the computer with the posture like this will have neck pain eventually and if it gets bad enough we'll have arm pain so even us participants fit one of the groups for sure so what is prp 
it's a platelet concentrate. It includes some of the white blood cells and the growth factors. The beauty of it, it's autologous. So there is not going to be an immune response. It's absolutely natural. It uses the growth factors to initiate tissue healing and bone healing. Of course, it enhances angiogenesis. We saw uh, the factors that are in, in the uh, dense granules, uh, increases collagen content, and it does have a bactericide and antimicrobial effect as well. Just to touch on the stem cells and the PRP, how they play together. So the PRP provides growth factors and stimulates angiogenesis. And the stem cells provide the source of cell to repair damaged tissue. Typical injury sites that do not heal well, uh, that are relatively avascular, will get, uh, get uh, uh, better blood circulation by the inflammatory cascade. So that takes us back again to this slide, how prolo or PRP or stem cells, I shouldn't say they are the same, but they are so close. Patients always ask me, which is better? And I don't know. We've done many of all, and I don't know. I think I'm a pretty genuine person, so I tend to say, start with prolotherapy because that is the cheapest. But for joints, intraarticular injections, I do prefer PRP. They seem to respond better. That's my personal experience. But when it comes to ligament, I cannot firmly say that PRP is any better than Prolo for now. Here is the PRP spun down, platelet pore is getting thrown away, and then use the Buffy coat. Very important that you inject the medications to the right spot. This needs a proper diagnostic evaluation. There's no success for any treatment options without the proper diagnosis. So we all need to have very good manual ex or physical exam skills to identify. Here I'm injecting uh, the glute medius tendon, which I've previously examined and identified as a source of a problem for this patient. Injection, injection protocol, uh, I'm going to get to practical parts now. So major joints, shoulder and hip, would get about six cc's. Tendons and ligaments could get a half a cc or one to two cc. Again, it's very different. If you inject the cervical spine, you do half a cc. If you inject the Achilles tendon, that's going to be probably two cc. How many times do we inject? That's also, it also varies among practitioners. The consensus is, is uh, one to three injections. In my country, we're paying for the PRP or for the treatment in a private practice where I work. It's, it's a lot of money for a Hungarian patient. So I tend to do with the PRP. I do one, I expect them to have benefits. And if it helps, it's very easy to do another one to make it even better, or maybe two more. With prolotherapy, I tend to, it's cheaper, I tend to just schedule six for low back and three, four for neck. What's the interval? Uh, it depends how much you are in a hurry between the uh, procedures. For top athletes, who really don't care about the procedural pain, all they want is to get back to sports, we actually do every three, four days and get them done. But for average patients who, who are not in a hurry, it's actually more comfortable to inject prolotherapy every three, four weeks, uh, PRP every month. It is otherwise too painful. If they come too frequently, it hurts. Important, pre-injection, you need to stop them taking anti-inflammatory medications. That includes not only the NSAIDs, but all the, uh, all the Chinese herbal teas that are anti-inflammatory. You want to maximize the powers of the inflammatory cascade. 
post injection, as no study is available, my recommendation is, and many other uh, doctors doing regenerative medicine, is gradually build up uh, the rehab. I tell them they can do anything and everything that they can do without pain medications. With that, I don't allow them to go back immediately to high impact sports. So no basketball, no downhill biking, but everything else, work around the house, going for a bit of walk, biking or walking on a flat ground is fine. Their pain will tell them when to stop. I used to tell my patients not to do anything and be careful about these newly built ligaments, but I don't think that's the right way. If they actually do their physical therapy, the collagens uh, line up a lot, uh, according to the forces, so they have a better outcome. We've done this. How long does it last? Uh, this is a study where they, they decided for NeoA, the benefit is 24 months. Uh, that's pretty good. If you consider steroids, they don't get that good results. Or the initial steroid, yes, but the consecutive steroid, no. And then, you know, the downside of the steroid because they take cartilage away. I tend to say my patients, let's come up with an example. If they come to me with a tennis elbow that they develop because they have a poor backhand in tennis, I can completely fix their tennis elbow, their lateral epicondylitis. But unless they change their technique, the problem will come back. So if they're able to fix the, correct the posture, if they don't have another injury, that's pretty much a fix. And you don't have to expect the patients back for several years, five, six. Uh, about the harvesting quickly, usually I use a 60 ml kit because anything less is just too little and too expensive. And I can, I do a lot of spine and that takes more volume. So you draw 50 ml of venous blood and you mix it with 10 ml of citrate. When you draw it, a couple of tricks that are important. You do not put the tourniquet on for very long because that uh, can destroy your platelets. You do not pull very hard because that makes it bubbly and destroy your platelets. It, you work with the platelets like they were eggs, very, very gently, okay? Uh, when you pick your kit, it's important that what's been shown, uh, that the platelet count actually counts. If it's too low platelet count, the outcomes are not as good. You want to have kits that are concentrating uh, eight to 10 times, six to, let's say four, four to eight times to the normal. And any company who will give you a, a kit and tell you that you, you take, 20 ml blood and 10 or 15 ml is PRP, don't ever believe them. It needs to concentrate the blood to the maximum of 10% of the volume. That's one simple check. So here you go. If the platelet count is under, uh, is, is 1.5 to 2 million, that is good. Anything over 3 million might inhibit wound healing, but if it's below, 500,000, that's platelet poor. You're not doing anything with it. Okay, let's, uh, I think I have a few more slides and then we'll stop for q and I, I see there are questions, then we'll review them. So let's look at the level of evidence. Obviously, level one, level two is what we're looking for. It's more than expert opinion. So when you look at annual tear of the lumbar disc, we have level one and level two evidence showing it works. For NEOA, the most studies are available. Level one, level two. Trochanteric bursitis, level two. Tennis elbow, patellar tendon, plantar fasciitis, rotator cuff, level one, level two, both available. I'll show you this slide. It's, I find it almost entertaining 
the lateral epicondylitis. If you see a study on the green box, it's good for PRP. If you see a study in the red box, it's bad, okay? So here you go, systematic review, comparing prolo, polydocanol, whole blood, good for PRP. Another one, efficacy and safety, good for PRP. Everything you see is a systematic review in randomized, of randomized controlled trials. Here's a negative one, but immediately here is the, uh, the editorial, how the previous red one was badly written. And there is more, all on epicondylitis. Very exciting. This is a benchmark study I thought I would show you among all the previous ones, that these guys are, they did a beautiful study. They compared PRP versus corticosteroid, and they included more uh, 100 patients who had pain for more than six months. It's a double-blind RCT. And they looked at VAS and DASH scores up to one year. And what they found that PRP was better both in pain and in function. Then there was another study uh, by the same group or another paper by the same group. Uh, they followed these patients for another year and again they found that the DASH score is better. Not only the VAS, the DASH, the func functional score, which is exactly what we care for. We want the patients to be functional. Uh, this table and the next one will show you knee OA. I am showing you the benchmarks, right? So the tennis elbow has the most studies for tendonitis. Knee OA has the most studies for, for intraarticular. Everything you see, red, uh, green tick, is proving that PRP here is superior to, to Tylenol. And then this one showing that it's superior to hyaluronic acid. Another one uh, over, uh, and another one that's negative. But if you look at this study in detail, then you'll find that the PRP they injected is not PRP. They injected platelet four plasma. Not going into details, but they drew 10 ml blood and injected four ml. That's never PRP. Okay. And there's another, some more, all of them, uh, positive, 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 and you find a negative study here. And this is different than the others because this was leukocyte rich. And we know, I have no slides on it to show, but you don't want to put a lot of leukocyte and you don't want to put red blood cells uh, intraarticularly. The other studies that were leukocyte poor, red blood cell poor, they are good for PRP. For NeoA. And there is one on DISC. This is a famous patin study on DISC bone marrow concentrate. He actually published three times on the same, same study. And um, he included 26 patients who had symptomatic disc disease. They were scheduled for surgery and then they had the option to do DISC BMC. And what they found is pretty good, I say, without the surgery 67% reduction in osvestry disability index, and quite a bit in BAS. I think three patients ended up going for surgery over the three years. Uh, this is a knee OA on uh, prolotherapy, a systematic review and meta-analysis. They, they found 258 patients. They were really strict in their methodology. And what they found that prolotherapy conferred a positive and significant beneficial effect in the treatment of knee OA. And this one I also like partly because it came out from Mayo Clinic for TMJ problem. They used prolotherapy and they followed the patients for one year and they found significant pain and function improvement with very high satisfaction of the patient. I think it's fantastic. And finally, i show you this paper because they looked at the complications. And that's, I think, the, one of the most important aspects of PRP or regenerative medicine. The complications are absolutely minor. Local pain, local pain, 
and you can have infections. But the, everything, no devastating complications, no patients do worse from regenerative medicine. And every complication is related more to the procedure, not so much to what you inject. I think we arrive to Q&A. Okay. Thank you, Agi. There's a lot of question here. I I read it one in the Q and A section. Do uh, I go on the chat and I can pick, or do you want? No, I will read it. Or somebody. Uh, the first one, Doctor Ahmad Yasin. Uh, he asked you about cell injury. To what extent? It is similar to tenotomy. He has two questions, and the other question is. I see. You can you can read it. Lidocaine might be less beneficial from regeneration. Does it mean we don't need to include it in the prolo injection cocktail? I'm very happy with both questions. I think they touch on something very important. Now, cell injury. To what extent? I think it is indeed similar to tenotomy, which is something that. Uh, Physical medicine and rehab doctors figured out that if they do a bit of tenotomy, the patients do that better. I even heard a PMNR doctor saying, I figured if I do tenotomy and do less steroid, it's better. Now, why is that? Of course, because you don't draw in the inflammatory process that you just created the tenotomy. So yes, uh, it is similar to tenotomy. And the other thing relating to this, that many of the prolotherapists use a technique called peppering, pepper, pepper, pepper with a needle, that again, to create cell injury. The other question, if it's better to do lidocaine, no lidocaine to improve regeneration. Uh, also fantastic, if you talk to a lot of the prolotherapists, uh, everybody came to the conclusion that if you lower the lidocaine, it is possibly better. We cannot prove it. What I myself do, uh, intra-articularly, I no longer put any lidocaine in my proto solution. It's only lidocaine 20% uh, with saline. That's how I dilute my uh, dextrose. And it's not painful. When you do tendons, it is so painful without lidocaine that your patient will not come back. So I do put a little bit of lidocaine but my overall LIDO concentration is like 0.3%, very little. Did you answer your question? Uh, Yasin, Dr. Yasin. Uh, Wilman, can we, can, can we show Dr. Yes. Yasin? Ah, okay. okay. He's the one who asked the, uh, who asked the question. Dr. Yasin, you, any Dr. other question? No, I think Agnes already answered my question. Your, your presentation uh, really boosts my confidence in this therapy because, in fact, we have problem with uh, cost, of course, primary problem, yeah? and patient acceptance. And I already have one patient, uh, a fellow OBGYN, has problem with his pest answering bursitis. I gave only once Prolo using dextrosan. He is very satisfied with, with the result. Thank you for your lecture. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you Very good to hear this feedback. So the other question is from Dr. Tolga, Dr. Tolga Ergonic from Turkey. Uh, Finman, can you show Dr. Tolga face <laughs> so we can discuss this? No? Are we waiting for Tolga to talk? Oh, that, that's Dr. Tolga. Yeah, yeah. We we're going to let the talk, Dr. Tolga to talk. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hi, Tolga. <laughs> uh, thank you for the Agnes uh, to Agnes for the perfect presentation. Thank you again. Thank you. Anna, I would like to ask some thing about the ozone, ozone, medical ozone therapy about in uh, regenerative medicine. What do you think about 
Dr. Agnes, about medical ozone. Yeah, medical ozone. I hate to say that, uh, I don't know, I purchased an ozone machine. It's sitting in my office, ready to try, because it is, does have actually coming up good literature, and I hear a lot of good experience, but I myself do not have any experience with it, unfortunately. But I will let you know, in a year, I'm sure I will. I will. I never do with ozone. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, any other question, Dr. Tolga? Uh, thank you very much uh, for this excellent presentation to Dr. Dr. Agnes, and uh, also Yossi. Yeah, Agnes, Dr. Toga will be the next speaker of our uh, YAP talk. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Looking forward to hearing it. I won't yeah. miss it. <laughs> Very nice. The other question Indeed. is from Dr. Henny. Yes, I read it. Dr. Henny. Irman, can you show the Dr. Henny face? Dr. Henny is one of my friends in Indonesia. Oh, I see a lot of questions. If I open chat, yes. I myself see so many questions. <laughs> okay, let's start with another question. Uh, would you please mention contraindication or limitation of PRP from Dr. Siddiqui, Bangladesh? Okay, so you think of the general ones, okay? Infection, allergy to maybe lidocaine, patient doesn't agree. I would say no specific contraindications to these procedures. Uh, there is a relative contraindication. If somebody takes steroid for another disease or, or uh, is on an anticoagulant uh, platelet inhibitor, that, you know, it's listed as a relative contraindication, but I find it will still work. I, I am a bit puzzled by it. I used to warn my patients if they took steroids, hey, you know, we can try, but maybe it needs more session, I don't know. But they seem to respond equally well. So even for patients with, say, rheumatoid arthritis, high dose of steroid, now I do prolotherapy, no problem with good outcomes. I don't know about any publication on it, though. OK. <laughs> This is the same question from Hafiz. I know one Hafiz. important contraindication, guys. Sorry to interrupt you, see. One very yeah. important. If a doctor is not familiar with the anatomy and the diagnosis, that's the most important. Because if a lot of the do not doctor, doctors, or in some countries, the naturopath put needle everywhere, and that gives a bad name to an otherwise beautiful tool. So always, when you do and learn uh, Prolo or PRP, pick a small area, do it, learn it, and when you have success with it, then expand. Hey. Yossi. Yes, this is, this is an interesting question. Do you experience using hyaluronic acid and compare it with PRP? Yes, yes. So first, I can tell you my experience, but let's look at the literature first. When you look at hyaluronic acid, all the benefits have been shown up to six months. And the patients don't come with the disease that's for six months. So I essentially gave up hyaluronic acid. It's very expensive and it doesn't last. And I have a lot of success with, success with regenerative medicine uh, without the hyaluronic acid, and that lasts much longer. Okay. We have another question. This is a good question from Johan, Dr. Johan. Okay, my friend, Dr. Johan Budi Hartono. Uh, is this the different efficacy between poor leukocyte and rich leukocyte PRP? Uh, yes, I see the question. Uh, the concept is. Intraarticularly, you do not put leukocyte rich because it will promote osteoarthritis. You're harming your patients. So you make sure that you leave the bottom of the white, which is white blood cells, garbage. The top is the good bits. 
when you do ligaments, then you can use leukocyte rich mm. and red blood cell rich. It doesn't seem to be harmful. Uh, it always is though more painful. Okay, the more red blood cells, the more white blood cells, the more painful it is. And for those who have not processed uh, uh, PRP, when you aspirate your PRP, first you get to the platelet poor garbage. Yes. Platelet rich, you keep. And then just below the, the platelets, you have the white blood cells and the red blood cells pretty much mixed together. Okay, so your, your leukocyte rich will be a red PRP. Your leukocyte poor will be a yeah. yellow PRP. Oh, and then he also asked about uh, when you take in the patient with uh, high blood glucose, is it okay to take the blood from uh, for PRP in the patient with high blood glucose? Again, what is high blood glucose, right? Is are we talking about a diabetic emergency? Don't worry about the pain management then. But if it's a controlled uh, diabetic patient, it's totally fine. Right? Another question is. How about uh, if we do uh, follow our uh, PRP to the patient with cancer, cancer pain? Is it okay? Yeah. Super nice to hear that question. Yes, it is okay. You're not injecting any cells that will take their own uh, lead and start uh, reproducing. So PRP is yes, absolutely fine. Theoretically, bone marrow should be fine too. But most practitioners stay away from that. Okay. We don't know how it works. But PRP is perfect. Prolo, perfect. Oh, so, so it's okay with, if you do it with a cancer patient. No problem. Yes. So, how about the nerve entrapment problem? Can we use the prolotherapy or PRP for nerve entrapment for problem? Nerve entrapment problem. Uh, I didn't have much success with it, I gotta say. Um, I don't know, I had a few cases where it magically seemed to work CRPS patients and I have some others where it didn't. I don't know. My experience is mainly in musculoskeletal spine, tendon, ligaments, cartilage. And another question was from Dr. Asmi Ali Argi. Does the effusion of knee with osteoarthritis affect the efficacy of PRP? Ah, this is a great question. So this when you have good. a when you have a bloody effusion, you have an acute injury, is what we're talking about, correct? No, no, no. I think the chronic effusion, not the bloody effusion. You know, chronic heavy, heavy, having a baker cyst and excess yes, fluid yes. in the knee. It is so that uh, excess uh, fluid, intraarticular fluid, is a sign of a problem. It is not the problem itself, unless the baker cyst gets so big that it is pushing on something. It's not the problem itself. What I do with those, I aspirate the fluid and I replace it with PRP or prolotherapy. And then I make the patients wear uh, a knee, what do they call it, a bandage, uh, knee bandage, very tight for 72 hours. And you can absolutely get rid of the Baker cyst. Because it's tight, you put the glue, the PRP in, it will seal the walls of the Baker cyst. So after two, three teeth treatments, most of the Baker cyst disappear. Okay. Ah, this is about the concentration of the dextrose. What do you use? Simple. Ligaments, 15%, 1,5. Intraarticular, 20%. 50, 25, 20%. Not more than 20%, Aggie? No, 20 is good. 20 is simple and perfect. How about 5%? Can we use it? 5% dextrose? <laughs> so 5% dextrose is not prolotherapy. It is neural prolo, right? Uh, 
Liftoft is teaching and published a lot about neuroprolo. The concept is, his concept is that some of those little nerve fibers, entrapment and lack of good uh, blood circulation leads to the problem. I use it sometimes, not as much as Prolo, but some patients have magically good answer for uh, response to it. Okay. Firman, we have Dr. Henny for to show. Dr. Henny, can you show Dr. Henny? Okay. Before 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 Firman uh, show Dr. Henny face, there is a question from Dr. Poppy. Uh, do we need to combine? Do yeah? Do we need to combine it uh, to combine prolotherapy with genicular nerve block for osteoarthritis uh, in the knee? So do we need to? No, we don't need to. But do we want to? Uh, maybe. The concepts are very different, right? You could do prolotherapy or PRP, and the promise is that you will have the knee pain by improving the stability of the knee, by removing the Baker cyst, by regrowing some of the broken up cartilage. But that takes time because you stimulate the body to lay down new tissue. It's not from Monday to Tuesday. So I often at the beginning combine it with the genicular nerve block. But the purpose is not to redo the geniculars, it's to use regenerative medicine. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, this is Dr. Mia, Dr. Mia Supanji. You, you know Dr. Mia. In the of clinical course practice, yeah. <laughs> in the clinical practice, it is compulsory to do prolotherapy for six times, or can we just stop when the symptoms or function are better? So we keep doing the prolo or we stop after the patient getting better? So it varies. When you do more, you will develop your experience with it. You find variations with, between patients. I usually say four to six times for low back and less for smaller joints, but you find both extremes. For example, my mother, my own mom, has such a strong response to prototherapy. She's essentially a unique one, bedridden for 24 hours with a fever, but then she's done. She doesn't need the repetition for years. And then you get patients, let's say, who have Ehlers-Danlos disease, which means they have faulty building bricks, and they would do even more, eight to 10 sessions. You also need to consider the type of injury. Somebody with a gigantic car accident, I don't think they get better with a few. So stick with the, the main rule is around four to six for big joints, and we'll figure it out. Okay, okay, I see. Hey, hi, Dr. Henny. <laughs> I give Dr. Henny will ask you a question. She's one of Hello. my friends. Hello, Dr. Agnes. Um, I've been such a big, uh, big fan of you. Thank you for your amazing presentation. I have a question for you. In your experience, uh, have you or do you perform prolotherapy or um, uh, regenerative medicine in case of uh, pain cancer. Is that, is, is it what? In, in what case? Uh, in a pen pen cancer. Pen? In pen cancer. Is it possible use this uh, prolotherapy or regenerative medicine? Henny, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. You're saying cancer. What cancer? Pen cancer. I mean, maybe, uh, for example, uh, metastatic, metastatic bone cancer or, or such a pen cancer. So, cancer pain, like yes. pain caused by cancer. So, yes. Sorry, sorry about it. So, you know, I don't see a role, right? What is cancer pain? It's either a complaint of something or a lytic tumor. I, I don't think PRP is much used for cancer pain because with cancer pain often the, the goal is not to regenerate tissue. The, the goal is to just take the way away for the time left for the patient. Mm -hmm. 
Do you see any role? Do you see any concept why PRP would work? Um, maybe, uh, maybe if the tumor has uh, infiltration in the uh, uh, to to, I mean, for for a uh, of uh, the pain caused by caused by uh, nerve entrapment by by uh, by the mass of. The, the the larger the larger man of mass maybe I don't know I I I, 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 don't know. I, I myself I didn't see the role of the this role therapy for cancer pain no uh, I think for possible. cancer pain the the key question is what is the life expectancy of the patient right if mm -hmm. it's short term you freeze or burn those nerves so they don't hurt you do something that takes mm -hmm. the pain away for that time. Mm -hmm. If it's a long life expectancy, then of course you you get back to these other conditions that are PRP treatable, but not the cancer itself. Okay, okay, okay. Thank okay. you, thank you, Amos. Thank you. Okay, I think I think I think we have so many questions. <laughs> we have so many questions, but we have to stop it for uh, for a while, and then we have to see about uh, we we have to see the video first. And then we will continue the Q and A session. So, uh, okay. I see one more good question that I'd like to answer. Yeah. Okay? okay. Just one, because I see somebody anonymous asked, "What's the selection criteria for intradiscal PRP?" And I think it's important mm. before we start poking. Yeah. So you need to have a good diagnosis. It's partly, uh, it's partly the history. These patients are the ones who have discogenic pain, a disc leakage, they don't sit. They come to your office and they will be standing, not sitting down. Very often, young and otherwise healthy looking patients. You will have an MRI that will show the HIZ, high intensity zone for the disc leakage. And you also exclude other conditions, right? With physical exam. And you pick one where the disc herniation is usually in the studies it's five no bigger than five millimeter i think that's a safety precaution so you don't actually compress nerves more but i find it also very nice and do uh, leukocyte poor for discs okay oh, yeah. so we're ready to go on yoshi yes yes uh, about the disc problem i think our next Speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Sudhir will talk about the regenerative therapy for the disc. Uh, so excellent, uh, excellent. We can, we can see in the next week, maybe next week, next week I think. Okay, you can start uh, the video, Aggie. Okay, so first I'm gonna present the case for you guys in a couple of slides, if I can. So this patient that I'm injecting is a 44 year old female with migraine headaches since absolutely early childhood. She has at least 12 days of debilitating headache. That means she spends 12 days in the dark room and then a couple of days to recover from the sumatriptan side effects and the drowsiness. So her life is like half of other people's. Uh, these are my typical questions I ask from the patient. This is a patient from last uh, September. She says the pain is at here, at the right part of the forehead, and then it goes all the way back in a, a sharp line, like there was a knife, all the way back to the occiput. Right? She has all the aura, she knows the 24 hours before the headache it's going to come, and then she has the nausea, the vomiting, she's light, sound, and smell sensitive. The, the headaches last three, four days, and then the recovery, as I mentioned. Uh, if you ask what brings them on, the hormonal cycle, it's not written here, but she listed stress and lack of sleep and the bad foods. So we started with removing the bad foods, the junk food, the, the alcohol, the cheeses, the chocolates, the oranges. We fixed her sleep and that already improved him. Her uh, any additional symptoms I always ask 
And this is what she has as an, as an additional symptom. She has Horner syndrome, a lid lag, and only at the migraines at the time I saw her. Uh, she tried physical therapy. She tried, she didn't try acupuncture. Uh, and she did not try Botox at the time either. And she, as a, as a job, she, is a prof she was a professional chess player. She actually was second on the world championship, but she had to quit because she had uh, low back pain. She couldn't sit with the chessboard, unfortunately. Now she works in the gaming industry. She still has to sit in front of a computer. When I examined her, I found a loss of cervical lordosis, loss of uh, decreased range of motion, midline tenderness. The cervical facet lines were very tender. Uh, I mixed up the side, right was more tender than the left. Tight cervical muscle, muscles and spurling was negative. Motor, sensory, totally fine. So I did initially prolotherapy on the cervical spine. And here are my prolotherapy targets. The blue ones are the supraspinous ligament. The red ones are for the facets. The yellow are the superficial layer of the cervical uh, muscles and the deep layer, oops, that's mistyped here, but obviously it's not the SI joint, but the deep layer of the cervical muscles. And then the oranges are the laminate. And with that, her headaches improved tremendously. Frequency down to one to two months, and they were only one to two days long. And she only, she could have her medication. So that's fantastic for her. It's not fantastic, I think, to throw up four days a month, but it's fantastic for her. But in March, uh, she developed the, uh, the permanent Horner syndrome. So of course, I sent her to brain MRI, chest x-ray, angio, carotid doppler, just to exclude the common reasons. But I was thinking it's from her spine. And this is her cervical MRI. You can study it with me. So at the level of C56, that's too fast, wait. So at the level of C56, she has a disc bulge. And you can see it on both images. And then I'm going to scroll up and down. She has another disc bulge, one level lower. And of course, you see this loss of cervical lordosis. That's a postural problem, a ligamentous problem. So she went to see an osteopath that she's been seeing since childhood, always got her better, and that's when she developed pain uh, shooting down the arm. This is my concept, not my concept at all. This is the concept that I believe in, uh, what happens in the cervical spine. <clears throat> if you lose your lordosis, then the spinous processes separate from each other more than normal. There is a forward pressure on the disc, disc bulges out, it pushes on the, on the posterior long, uh, longitudinal ligament, that is already in itself painful. So at this phase, the patient has pain at the ligaments, stress on the facets, at the uh, ligament, and maybe the disc even. And if that gets worse, then of course, you develop a radiculopathy. Furthermore, you can develop an enterolistasis. That's what she has. So I, that's why I did cervical facet thinking that cervicogenic pain is part of her migraine trigger, triggers. And this is how you prep the patient. I keep them starving for six hours. I don't give any anti-inflammatories or I tell them to stop. I tell them because it's the cervical spine, all these neck muscles will be numbed up. She will, they will have uh, dizziness for 10, 20 minutes. It goes away, but, and it's normal. I give them uh, Tylenol, Paracetamol three times a day, and if they need, I give them Tramadol. But exercise, they can do as they tolerate without painkillers. I give them vitamin C to promote the cross binding within the collagens, and of course, I tell them, eat healthy. No french fries and McDonald's. And this is the slide that show you or explains what I'm gonna do. This is the paper by Finlayson on how you do a medial branch block from posterior to anterior, right? 
this is posterior, posterior, anterior. Your needle comes from posterior after you visualize the articular pillar, the lamina, and the spinous process. Now you're not, you can gun for the, you can gun for the facet joint and the lamina, which is the attachment of the semispinalis muscles, and this uh, spinous process, which is the attachment of the supraspinous ligaments. Last slide, very, very important. The risk is great, not with the PRP, but with your needling. When you inject, I don't see myself, uh, this is the spinal cord, the dura. You can visualize it in some of the patients. It's so close that you can easily mess up. If, so if you don't see your needle, you do not go, okay? Now, let's get to the movie. I'm going to narrate. This is, this is the patient laying on the side that we talked about. It's very important that somebody pulls the arm or the patient pulls the arm down so the shoulder is as much as possible out of the way. Of course, it's done in a sterile condition. This is my PRP. Uh, I see how it looks very red on the camera. It was not that red. It's more of a pink PRP. There are red blood cells, not too many. Red blood cells are very easy to, to stain your fluid. This is relatively light, but I don't mind that it's red because it's going for the ligaments mainly. I used 120 ml of whole blood and I spun it down to, to 2 times 8 ml. This is the orientation of the ultrasound probe. And again, as I showed you, this is the Finlayson technique, as he published for medial branch. Uh, the left side of the screen, oh, I can't. So I can't show. The, this is anterior, and this is posterior. And I am scanning from cephalad to caudad to identify the levels. Here you see an articular pillar, a lamina, and the spinous process. You can also, then the needle will come from posterior, that's anterior. So again, the arrow is showing the articular pillar and the lamina. And then the spinous process. If you scan anteriorly, you can visualize the carotid. If you go further, you can visualize the vertebral artery. You can see the anterior tubercle. It's not the area of interest. I'm just showing it more for demonstration purposes. That's your target. I usually start at the top. You can visualize the C1 and the way, the way you can tell it is that the lamina is round. There is only a rudimentary spinous process. I think it will show better in a second. It's very round, no real valley like with the other other ones, All right? So this is C2 that has a valley. But I go back to C1. This is the vertebral artery. You can visualize the palpation. It's one of the high risk procedures. Uh, I'd like everybody to judge their own expertise and absolutely not do this until you are very confident. See, I'm moving the needle. If I don't know 100% where the tip is, I don't go. You need to look and go. There's my needle tip. There's my needle tip. And when it's touching on bone, then I inject, aspirate and inject. 
Bone is your friend. Bone keeps it safe. So that's, there we go, C1. And this is on the C1 arch. I can see how next time I can increase the gain on the ultrasound for the sake of recording, because it doesn't show as beautifully, but maybe the next one, the next one will be better, C2. Each location, I inject a half a cc, and then I slide code that, and here you can already see the C2 much easier to visualize, and it gets easier as you go south. So here you see articular pillar, and the needle coming in, injecting on the articular pillar. It's a fluid, you don't worry about going into articular much, and this was lamina injection. And then I slide down to C3, and here it becomes beautiful. It always shows better. Now you can see for sure. Anterior, posterior, articular pillar, lamina, spinous process, and the needle. And you can see that I always know where the needle is. I know I told you five times, I'm gonna tell you one more time. No needle, no go. Okay? You can see the joint opening. Here. So here, I, I got to the joint opening. I'm using a curvilinear probe because it gives a better overview of the whole spine. And then I slide down to the next level, which is C4. Here I can perfectly see the spinous process. So I inject on the spinous process as well, which is where the supraspinous ligament lives, the lamina, and spinous process. I, I want to make sure you understand, this is where the spinal cord is. So your needle is pointed towards the spinal cord. So if you don't get bone where you expect to have bone, you don't go further. You pull back, find your needle, and understand the anatomy again. And this is the articular pillar. I lost track of where we are. I believe we are at C6 here. Again, to the pillar where the facet joint is, the lamina, and the spinous process. These are my exact same targets for prolotherapy. And here we have uh, C7, the bit bigger transverse process. Lamina. And then this is going to be T1. You can see the first rib attaching, again, lamina. I am changing here to a linear probe, mainly to show the participants the actual joint spaces. And I had some PR left, so I go back and put some intraarticularly too, which is what I'm going to show. This probably is a view that you're more, more familiar with. I'm just going to turn it so it's the same orientation in a second. And so it's going to be the same orientation. What I am trying to visualize here is the actual facet joint openings, because that shows better with the linear probe. And here you see one immediately. This is the gap for the joint. Plus, you can see the needle nicer. 
but I think this probe is not so much suitable for injecting multiple angles and lamina. Here's another joint opening, and you can see the needle targeting the facet capsule. You can even see the fluid elevating the joint capsule. And another joint opening you could see. And there is that. So I think, I think this pretty much is it. Then I turn the patient and do the same procedure from the, from the other side. And of course, the targets I showed you in the slides on prolotherapy are the same exact targets for PRP. But this is the ultrasound guided part, the high risk part that everybody will inject when they are 100% comfortable with knee, then hip, then lumbar, then thoracic. Q&A? Thank you. OK. OK, we will continue with the Q&A. OK, from the bottom. Ah, again from Dr. Ahmad Yasin. In multiple injection sites, is there dose limit for dextrose given? Is there any dose limit? No. I don't know if you're, if you're concerned about blood sugar, it doesn't influence it at all. No, no. I tend to do less when the first patient first comes to me. Let's say I do lumbar spine and see how they respond. Because if, if they have a big flare, which you can't really predict, then too much is too much. But many of my patients would come back and say, you know, I can deal with this. And then I expand and do a bit of hip and thoracic spine. And as they are getting better, very commonly they say, you know, my back is better, but I have that neck as well. So can you just do that as well? And then they save some money on me and I do that. But don't do the whole spine at start. A patient needs to experience a smaller area first. Well, the patient uh, have a rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. Can we give a prolotherapy? Yes, you can give prolotherapy. Uh, it doesn't harm it. Actually, it does help it. Uh, if they are on steroids, I, I usually tell them that they may need more sessions or they may have a worse outcome. But if they sign up for it, I see that they do have benefit. I and you don't... Plan. You don't flare up the rheumatoid arthritis like the way you're worried about it. Oh, so it's, it's okay that we give it in the acute rheumatoid arthritis. It is okay. We give a prolotherapy. You don't want to inject when they actually have a flare, but they are on the maintenance therapy, and then you can work with them with regenerative medicine. Okay. Can we use PRP for pain after knee or hip surgery? So what's the role? I want to know who asked it. Why Dr. would you use? What's you, how do you justify? Dr. Rudy what's your Lusley. rationale? Sorry? Dr. Rudy Lusley from Indonesia, mm -hmm. I think. Firman, can you show Dr. Rudy? Okay, we, we, we move to another, another question. Uh, any rule for PRP for sacroiliac joint pain? Yes, uh, I do more prolotherapy. I think it's not so much a joint problem, it's more of a capsule problem. And prolotherapy is a magic, magic weapon for SI. That's gonna be one of your main targets. When you do SI, you will also observe, SI comes with facet. don't miss the facets. It's with regenerative medicine, I think the key to success is always to think in functional units. It needs a different mindset than standard pain medicine. You don't go for SI. You ask, why is it SI? Okay, because he found the buttocks. What else did he hear? What is the functional unit of the SI? And then it works perfect. There's a question about anticoagulant that you use for the PRP. I use citrate. Sodium citrate. Can we use no, uh, heparin or something like that? 
Oh, you should ask Matt Murphy on that. I, the, the bone marrow kit comes with heparin and it contains PRP, so certainly it should be good. Uh, the, my kit comes with citrate. Oh, okay. I see, I see your video. You give a multiple injection. Do you give local anesthetic before injection? Because uh, I be a little bit scary if I, you do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm afraid of needle. Uh, you know, I'm afraid of needle. So. <laughs> oh, don't touch them then. They're dangerous. So it depends. It's a cultural thing. It's a what's in your office thing. In Canada, I could not do anesthetic. So I always did local anesthetic. I was using a smaller needle. You could see I was using a 22 gauge needle. That's partly to protect my own thumb because I developed pain in my CMC joint from a lot of prolotherapy and PRP. So that's a bigger needle. But here in Hungary, the patient had fentanyl and uh, midazolam. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of locations to put lidocaine and it makes the procedure very, very small, slow. So now that I have easy access to anesthesia, you didn't hear, but there is a monitor beeping on the patient. It's easy for me. Now it's fast and easy. Okay, Dr. Rudy, Dr. Rudy Lusli. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Yossi and Dr. Agnes. Hi. 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 Yes, thank you for the opportunity to join this webinar. So my uh, question is about, uh, can we use Prolo or PRP for uh, strengthening the ligament after the knee uh, arthroplasty, like total knee or total hip? Usually uh, the, the patient still felt pain after the surgery, even four years after uh, the surgery is done. Thank you, Dr. Agnes and Dr. Yossi. So yes, you're so right, right? The, the, about 20 to 30% of the knee uh, replacement patients report pain after the surgery. And if you examine them, they do have the ligament laxity, which in my mind led to the problem in the first place. So yes, you do, you do prolotherapy or PRP for them very much. Thank you, Dr. Agnes. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Rudy. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, this is a question you already. I think I think uh, you already answered all the question, Aggie. I will check it again. Oh, mm -hmm. how big is the failure rate of prolotherapy when the patient is still taking insane? I don't think there is a, an indication for NSAIDs that they, cannot, that they can stop it. You can change it to tramadol if they are really in so much pain. So I always take them off the NSAIDs. I never take them off their baby aspirin that they use to prevent their heart attack. I leave that and it's fine. It doesn't seem to cause any problems. Oh, okay. So I did. Oh. I, I see we have uh, active participants more than 300 person today. <laughs> so it's Good our job, new Yossi. record. <laughs> it's our new record. <laughs> Good job, and, Yossi, really. Good job. It's super that yeah. you organized it. No, no, no. no. It's because, because they want to hear, hear from you. They want to learn from you. So they're eager to learn from you. So we have to finish our a session today, uh, but I will say to all the participants that we have, we will have another talk in next week with Professor Sudhir D1 from US and also uh, Dr. Toga Ergonek from the Turkey. Uh, Prof. Sudhir will talk about regenerative therapy in the disc. So it's very, very interesting topic. Uh, I hope uh, all the participants can join us uh, next week. And 
Uh, sorry, I will read it first. Okay, yes, yeah. says for episode of episode four from Sudi D1. He's the president of Advanced Plan on Park Avenue, New York, and now uh, president of uh, American Society International Pen Practice. So uh, I will say again, thank you for Aggie for giving a good lecture, amazing lecture, and a very good discussion with the participant. Uh, I hope someday you will come again to Indonesia. I will bring you to another island of Indonesia. <laughs> and I hope uh, maybe uh, you can give us another talk in a yacht talk in maybe another episode. Thank okay. you so much for inviting me, Yoshi and Linda. And you seem to be doing a great organization. It's beautiful you're doing it. And with so many participants, maybe the pain world will become a better world. Great job. Thank you so much. And thanks for the participants for taking the time and coming to learn. Okay. Thank you, Aggie. And bye bye, those everybody. Those... Have a lovely bye. day or evening. Bye. See Thank you another you. time. And yes, I'm coming to Indonesia because I loved it last time. <laughs> bye bye. Yes, bye. Okay, Padri. Once I again, thank you for, for you. Thanks for and tips, but to recognize, I think it's already left because it's one very wonderful and insightful presentation for everyone. Before we leave, we would like to encourage all of the participants to participate in our polling or feedback of today's session in this uh, and the sharing uh, this uh, feedback polling it will sh share on the screen in front of you, and there is a polling for you to fill it right now. And don't and join on the next series and stay tuned for any update in Dr. Yossi Instagram and Pain Institute Indonesia YouTube. Once again, thank you very much for all of the participants for joining in and for our speaker, Dr. Agnes and moderator, Dr. Yossi. And also thank you to our crew organizing, organizing team behind the scene. And today's event is brought to you by Pen Institute of Indonesia and our sponsor, Novel Propifel, and supporting organizer by Eskol Academy. Stay tuned for the next episode and we'll see you next week and goodbye.